Section 17 of Reflections on the Revolution in France. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reflections on the Revolution in France and on the proceedings in certain societies in London relative to that event, in a letter intended to have been sent to a gentleman in Paris, 1790, by Edmund Burke. Section 17. You see, I only consider this constitution as electoral, and leading by steps to the National Assembly. I do not enter into the internal government of the departments and their genealogy through the communes and cantons. These local governments are, in the original plan, to be as nearly as possible composed in the same manner, and on the same principles, with the elective assemblies. They are each of them bodies perfectly compact and rounded in themselves. You cannot but perceive in this scheme that it has a direct and immediate tendency to sever France into a variety of republics, and to render them totally independent of each other, without any direct constitutional means of coherence, connection, or subordination, except what may be derived from their acquiescence in the determinations of the General Congress of the ambassadors from each independent republic. Such in reality is the National Assembly. And such governments, I admit, do exist in the world, though in forms infinitely more suitable to the local and habitual circumstances of their people. But such associations, rather than bodies politic, have generally been the effect of necessity, not choice. And I believe the present French power is the very first body of citizens who, having obtained full authority to do with their country what they pleased, have chosen to dissever it in this barbarous manner. It is impossible not to observe that, in the spirit of this geometrical distribution and arithmetical arrangement, these pretended citizens treat France exactly like a country of conquest. Acting as conquerors, they have imitated the policy of the harshest of that harsh race, the policy of such barbarous victors who contemn a subdued people and insult their feelings, has ever been, as much as in them lay, to destroy all vestiges of the ancient country in religion, in polity, in laws, and in manners, to confound all territorial limits, to produce a general poverty, to put up their properties to auction, to crush their princes, nobles, and pontiffs, to lay low everything which had lifted its head above the level, or which could serve to combine or rally in their distresses the disbanded people under the standard of old opinion. They have made France free in the manner in which those sincere friends to the rights of mankind, the Romans, freed Greece, Macedon, and other nations. They destroyed the bonds of their union under color of providing for the independence of each of their cities. When the members who compose these new bodies of cantons, communes, and departments, arrangements purposely produced through the medium of confusion, begin to act, they will find themselves in a great measure strangers to one another. The electors and elected throughout, especially in the rural cantons, will be frequently without any civil habitudes or connections, or any of that natural discipline which is the soul of a true republic. Magistrates and collectors of revenue are now no longer acquainted with their districts, bishops with their dioceses, or curates with their parishes. These new colonies of the rights of men bear a strong resemblance to that sort of military colonies which Tacitus has observed upon in the declining policy of Rome. In better and wiser days, whatever course they took with foreign nations, they were careful to make the elements of a methodical subordination and settlement to be coeval, and even to lay the foundations of discipline in the military. Footnote. Non, ut oli, universae legiones de ducebantur, cum tribunis et centurionibus, et sui cuiusque ordinis militibus, ut consensu et caritate rem publicam efficerent, sed ignoti inter se, diversis manipulis, sine rectore, sine affectibus mutuis, quasi ex alio genere mortalium repente in unum collecti, numerus magis quam colonia. Tacitus, Annales. All this will still be more applicable to the unconnected, rotatory, biennial national assemblies in this absurd and senseless constitution. End of footnote. 
but when all the good arts had fallen into ruin they proceeded as your assembly does upon the equality of men and with as little judgment and as little care for those things which make a republic tolerable or durable but in this as well as almost every instance your new commonwealth is born and bred and fed in those corruptions which mark degenerated and worn-out republics your child comes into the world with the symptoms of death the facies hippocratica forms the character of its physiognomy and the prognostic of its fate the legislators who framed the ancient republics knew that their business was too arduous to be accomplished with no better apparatus than the metaphysics of an undergraduate and the mathematics and arithmetic of an exciseman they had to do with men and they were obliged to study human nature they had to do with citizens and they were obliged to study the effects of those habits which are communicated by the circumstances of civil life they were sensible that the operation of this second nature on the first produced a new combination and thence arose many diversities amongst men according to their birth their education their professions the periods of their lives their residence in towns or in the country their several ways of acquiring and of fixing property and according to the quality of the property itself all which rendered them as it were so many different species of animals from hence they thought themselves obliged to dispose their citizens into such classes and to place them in such situations in the state as their peculiar habits might qualify them to fill and to allot to them such appropriated privileges as might secure to them what their specific occasions required and which might furnish to each description such force as might protect it in the conflict caused by the diversity of interests that must exist and must contend in all complex society for the legislator would have been ashamed that the coarse husbandman should well know how to assort and to use his sheep horses and oxen and should have enough of common sense not to abstract and equalize them all into animals without providing for each kind an appropriate food care and employment whilst he the economist disposer and shepherd of his own kindred subliming himself into an airy metaphysician was resolved to know nothing of his flocks but as men in general it is for this reason that montesquieu observed very justly that in their classification of the citizens the great legislators of antiquity made the greatest display of their powers and even soared above themselves it is here that your modern legislators have gone deep into the negative series and sunk even below their own nothing as the first sort of legislators attended to the different kinds of citizens and combined them into one commonwealth the others the metaphysical and alchemistical legislators have taken the directly contrary course they have attempted to confound all sorts of citizens as well as they could into one homogeneous mass and then they divided this their amalgama into a number of incoherent republics they reduced men to loose counters merely for the sake of simple telling and not to figures whose power is to arise from their place in the table the elements of their own metaphysics might have taught them better lessons the troll of their categorical table might have informed them that there was something else in the intellectual world besides substance and quantity they might learn from the catechism of metaphysics that there were eight heads more footnote qualitas relatio actio passio ubi quando situs habitus End of footnote in every complex deliberation which they have never thought of though these of all the ten are the subject on which the skill of man can operate anything at all so far from this able disposition of some of the old republican legislators which follows with a solicitous accuracy the moral conditions and propensities of men they have levelled and crushed together all the orders which they found even under the coarse unartificial arrangement of the monarchy in which mode of government the classing of the citizens is not of so much importance as in a republic it is true however that every such classification if properly ordered is good in all forms of government and composes a strong barrier against the excesses of despotism as well as it is the necessary means of giving effect and permanence to a republic for want of something of this kind 
if the present project of a republic should fail all securities to a moderated freedom fail along with it all the indirect restraints which mitigate despotism are removed insomuch that if monarchy should ever again obtain an entire ascendancy in france under this or any other dynasty it will probably be if not voluntarily tempered at setting out by the wise and virtuous counsels of the prince the most completely arbitrary power that has ever appeared on earth this is to play a most desperate game the confusion which attends on all such proceedings they even declare to be one of their objects and they hope to secure their constitution by a terror of a return of those evils which attended their making it by this say they its destruction will become difficult to authority which cannot break it up without the entire disorganization of the whole state they presume that if this authority should ever come to the same degree of power that they have acquired it would make a more moderate and chastised use of it and would piously tremble entirely to disorganize the state in the savage manner that they have done they expect from the virtues of returning despotism the security which is to be enjoyed by the offspring of their popular vices i wish sir that you and my readers would give an attentive perusal to the work of m de calonne on this subject it is indeed not only an eloquent but an able and instructive performance i confine myself to what he says relative to the constitution of the new state and to the condition of the revenue as to the disputes of this minister with his rivals i do not wish to pronounce upon them as little do i mean to hazard any opinion concerning his ways and means financial or political for taking his country out of its present disgraceful and deplorable situation of servitude anarchy bankruptcy and beggary i cannot speculate quite so sanguinely as he does but he is a frenchman and has a closer duty relative to those objects and better means of judging of them than i can have i wish that the formal avowal which he refers to made by one of the principal leaders in the assembly concerning the tendency of their scheme to bring france not only from a monarchy to a republic but from a republic to a mere confederacy may be very particularly attended to it adds new force to my observations and indeed m de calonne's work supplies my deficiencies by many new and striking arguments on most of the subjects of this letter it is this resolution to break their country into separate republics which has driven them into the greatest number of their difficulties and contradictions if it were not for this all the questions of exact equality and these balances never to be settled of individual rights population and contribution would be wholly useless the representation though derived from parts would be a duty which equally regarded the whole each deputy to the assembly would be the representative of france and of all its descriptions of the many and of the few of the rich and of the poor of the great districts and of the small all these districts would themselves be subordinate to some standing authority existing independently of them an authority in which their representation and everything that belongs to it originated and to which it was pointed this standing unalterable fundamental government would make and it is the only thing which could make that territory truly and properly a whole with us when we elect popular representatives we send them to a council in which each man individually is a subject and submitted to a government complete in all its ordinary functions with you the elective assembly is the sovereign and the sole sovereign all the members are therefore integral parts of this sole sovereignty but with us it is totally different with us the representative separated from the other parts can have no action and no existence the government is the point of reference of the several members and districts of our representation this is the center of our unity this government of reference is a trustee for the whole and not for the parts so is the other branch of our public council i mean the house of lords with us the king and the lords are several and joint securities for the equality of each district each province each city when did you hear in great britain of any province suffering from the inequality of its representation what district from having no representation at all 
not only our monarchy and our peerage secure the equality on which our unity depends but it is the spirit of the house of commons itself the very inequality of representation which is so foolishly complained of is perhaps the very thing which prevents us from thinking or acting as members for districts cornwall elects as many members as all scotland but is cornwall better taken care of than scotland few trouble their heads about any of your bases out of some giddy clubs most of those who wish for any change upon any plausible grounds desire it on different ideas your new constitution is the very reverse of ours in its principle and i am astonished how any persons could dream of holding out anything done in it as an example for great britain with you there is little or rather no connection between the last representative and the first constituent the member who goes to the national assembly is not chosen by the people nor accountable to them there are three elections before he is chosen two sets of magistracy intervene between him and the primary assembly so as to render him as i have said an ambassador of a state and not the representative of the people within a state by this the whole spirit of the election is changed nor can any corrective your constitution mongers have devised render him anything else than what he is the very attempt to do it would inevitably introduce a confusion if possible more horrid than the present there is no way to make a connection between the original constituent and the representative but by the circuitous means which may lead the candidate to apply in the first instance to the primary electors in order that by their authoritative instructions and something more perhaps these primary electors may force the two succeeding bodies of electors to make a choice agreeable to their wishes but this would plainly subvert the whole scheme it would be to plunge them back into that tumult and confusion of popular election which by their interposed gradation of elections they mean to avoid and at length to risk the whole fortune of the state with those who have the least knowledge of it and the least interest in it this is a perpetual dilemma into which they are thrown by the vicious weak and contradictory principles they have chosen unless the people break up and level this gradation it is plain that they do not at all substantially elect to the assembly indeed they elect as little in appearance as reality what is it we all seek for in an election to answer its real purposes you must first possess the means of knowing the fitness of your man and then you must retain some hold upon him by personal obligation or dependence for what end are these primary electors complimented or rather mocked with a choice they can never know anything of the qualities of him that is to serve them nor has he any obligation whatsoever to them of all the powers unfit to be delegated by those who have any real means of judging that most peculiarly unfit is what relates to a personal choice in case of abuse that body of primary electors never can call the representative to an account for his conduct he is too far removed from them in the chain of representation if he acts improperly at the end of his two years lease it does not concern him for two years more by the new french constitution the best and the wisest representatives go equally with the worst into this limbus patrum their bottoms are supposed foul and they must go into dock to be refitted every man who has served in an assembly is ineligible for two years after just as these magistrates begin to learn their trade like chimney sweepers they are disqualified for exercising it superficial new petulant acquisition and interrupted dronish broken ill recollection is to be the destined character of all your future governors your constitution has too much of jealousy to have much of sense in it you consider the breach of trust in the representative so principally that you do not at all regard the question of his fitness to execute it this purgatory interval is not unfavorable to a faithless representative who may be as good a canvasser as he was a bad governor in this time he may cabal himself into a superiority over the wisest and most virtuous as in the end all the members of this elective constitution are equally fugitive and exist only for the election 
they may be no longer the same persons who had chosen him to whom he is to be responsible when he solicits for a renewal of his trust to call all the secondary electors of the commune to account is ridiculous impracticable and unjust they may themselves have been deceived in their choice as the third set of electors those of the department may be in theirs in your elections responsibility cannot exist finding no sort of principle of coherence with each other in the nature and constitution of the several new republics of france i considered what cement the legislators had provided for them from any extraneous materials their confederations their spectacles their civic feasts and their enthusiasm i take no notice of they are nothing but mere tricks but tracing their policy through their actions i think i can distinguish the arrangements by which they propose to hold these republics together the first is the confiscation with the compulsory paper currency annexed to it the second is the supreme power of the city of paris the third is the general army of the state of this last i shall reserve what i have to say until i come to consider the army as an head by itself as to the operation of the first the confiscation and paper currency merely as a cement i cannot deny that these the one depending on the other may for some time compose some sort of cement if their madness and folly in the management and in the tempering of the parts together does not produce a repulsion in the very outset but allowing to the scheme some coherence and some duration it appears to me that if after a while the confiscation should not be found sufficient to support the paper coinage as i am morally certain it will not then instead of cementing it will add infinitely to the dissociation distraction and confusion of these confederate republics both with relation to each other and to the several parts within themselves but if the confiscation should so far succeed as to sink the paper currency the cement is gone with the circulation in the meantime its binding force will be very uncertain and it will straighten or relax with every variation in the credit of the paper one thing only is certain in this scheme which is an effect seemingly collateral but direct i have no doubt in the minds of those who conduct this business that is its effect in producing an oligarchy in every one of the republics a paper circulation not founded on any real money deposited or engaged for amounting already to four and forty millions of english money and this currency by force substituted in the place of the coin of the kingdom becoming thereby the substance of its revenue as well as the medium of all its commercial and civil intercourse must put the whole of what power authority and influence is left in any form whatsoever it may assume into the hands of the managers and conductors of this circulation in england we feel the influence of the bank though it is only the centre of a voluntary dealing he knows little indeed of the influence of money upon mankind who does not see the force of the management of a moneyed concern which is so much more extensive and in its nature so much more depending on the managers than any of ours but this is not merely a money concern there is another member in the system inseparably connected with this money management it consists in the means of drawing out at discretion portions of the confiscated lands for sale and carrying on a process of continual transmutation of paper into land and land into paper when we follow this process in its effects we may conceive something of the intensity of the force with which this system must operate by this means the spirit of money jobbing and speculation goes into the mass of land itself and incorporates with it by this kind of operation that species of property becomes as it were volatilized it assumes an unnatural and monstrous activity and thereby throws into the hands of the several managers principal and subordinate parisian and provincial all the representative of money and perhaps a full tenth part of all the land in france which has now acquired the worst and most pernicious part of the evil of a paper circulation the greatest possible uncertainty in its value they have reversed the latonian kindness to the landed property of delos they have sent theirs to be blown about like the light fragments of a wreck oras et litora circum 
the new dealers being all habitually adventurers and without any fixed habits or local predilections will purchase to job out again as the market of paper or of money or of land shall present an advantage for though a holy bishop thinks that agriculture will derive great advantages from the enlightened usurers who are to purchase the church confiscations i who am not a good but an old farmer with great humility beg leave to tell his late lordship that usury is not a tutor of agriculture and if the word enlightened be understood according to the new dictionary as it always is in your new schools i cannot conceive how a man's not believing in god can teach him to cultivate the earth with the least of any additional skill or encouragement diis immortalibus sero said an old roman when he held one handle of the plough whilst death held the other though you were to join in the commission all the directors of the two academies to the directors of the caisse d'escompte an old experienced peasant is worth them all i have got more information upon a curious and interesting branch of husbandry in one short conversation with an old carthusian monk than i have derived from all the bank directors that i have ever conversed with however there is no cause for apprehension from the meddling of money dealers with rural economy these gentlemen are too wise in their generation at first perhaps their tender and susceptible imaginations may be captivated with the innocent and unprofitable delights of a pastoral life but in a little time they will find that agriculture is a trade much more laborious and much less lucrative than that which they had left after making its panegyric they will turn their backs on it like their great precursor and prototype they may like him begin by singing beatus ille but what will be the end haec ubi locutus foenerator alpius iam iam futurus rusticus omnem relegit idibus pecuniam quaerit calendis ponere they will cultivate the caisse de iglis under the sacred auspices of this prelate with much more profit than its vineyards and its cornfields they will employ their talents according to their habits and their interests they will not follow the plough whilst they can direct treasuries and govern provinces your legislators in everything new are the very first to have founded a commonwealth upon gaming and infused this spirit into it as its vital breath the great object in these politics is to metamorphose france from a great kingdom into one great play-table to turn its inhabitants into a nation of gamesters to make speculation as extensive as life to mix it with all its concerns and to divert the whole of the hopes and fears of the people from their usual channels into the impulses passions and superstitions of those who live on chances they loudly proclaim their opinion that this their present system of a republic cannot possibly exist without this kind of gaming fund and that the very thread of its life is spun out of the staple of these speculations the old gaming in funds was mischievous enough undoubtedly but it was so only to individuals even when it had its greatest extent in the mississippi and south sea it affected but few comparatively where it extends further as in lotteries the spirit has but a single object but where the law which in most circumstances forbids and in none countenances gaming is itself debauched so as to reverse its nature and policy and expressly to force the subject to this destructive table by bringing the spirit and symbols of gaming into the minutest matters and engaging everybody in it and in everything a more dreadful epidemic distemper of that kind is spread than yet has appeared in the world with you a man can neither earn nor buy his dinner without a speculation what he receives in the morning will not have the same value at night what he is compelled to take as pay for an old debt will not be received as the same when he comes to pay a debt contracted by himself nor will it be the same when by prompt payment he would avoid contracting any debt at all industry must wither away economy must be driven from your country careful provision will have no existence who will labor without knowing the amount of his pay who will study to increase what none can estimate who will accumulate when he does not know the value of what he saves if you abstract it from its uses in gaming 
to accumulate your paper wealth would be not the providence of a man but the distempered instinct of a jackdaw end of section seventeen